Hi, I'm Bart Paulson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In it, we're looking at the first online quiz for Chapter 3, which is about infancy. The first question in this quiz is, which study supports the idea that smell is a vehicle for mother-infant recognition and attachment? Well, the first one is that when breastfeeding mothers significantly change their diets, their babies no longer prefer the smell of their nursing pads. Or B, breastfed babies, but not bottle-fed babies, prefer the odor of their mother's underarms. C, before even tasting the bottle, breastfed babies refuse the milk of another mother, but accepted formula. Or D, fathers who wore the t-shirts of breastfeeding mothers, but not bottle-feeding mothers, reported less crying when caring for their newborns. Well, okay, it, there's a lot of text on this particular one, and I feel a little bit like we're playing what's my line. But the correct answer in this case is B, that breastfed babies, but not bottle-fed babies, prefer the odor of their mother's underarms compared to that of other mothers. And so the idea here is that in the terms of nursing, you know, the baby is up very close to where the, where the underarm is, and they, they develop that. Smells a very powerful thing, especially for memory and emotion. Um, so anyhow, it's B. All right, number two. Sonia decides to, teach, to excuse me, Sonia decides to teach her eight-month-old son, Max, to wave his hands when he is hungry by giving him his favorite cracker every time he randomly waves his hands. One morning, Sonia catches Max waving his hands, so she searches through the pantry to find his crackers. Is Max likely to learn through Sonia's technique? This one gets a little complicated. The first one says, no, babies typically do not learn from operant conditioning until they are at least one year old. B, yes, Sonia has chosen Max's favorite snacks, so he is likely to repeat the behavior. C, no, for the reinforcer to work on an eight month old baby, it must be given within two seconds of the behavior. Or D, yes, Sonia has chosen an easy action for an eight-month-old hand-waving and an effective motivator, hunger. Okay, again, rather complicated, but here is the answer. It's that when you're doing the operant conditioning, yeah, babies can learn that. They learn it very well. I mean, sea slugs learn through operant conditioning, so babies can do it too. But you need to have this immediate contingency. They perform the behavior. you got to get it quickly. Here it says within two seconds, which actually may seem really short, but that, you know, if you're training a dog, you know that when you um, tell them to do something and they do it, you gotta get to it right away so they can build the association. They don't have a lot of, uh, you know, short-term memory is pretty short, and especially it is with an infant or an animal, so within two seconds. So if you don't have the treat ready, it's not gonna work. All right, number three. What is the evidence that the soothing function of sucking need not be learned through experience? And the uh, choices are A, babies mimic the sucking motion when not at rest or during sleep. C, as, excuse me, B, as a baby outgrows colic, their rooting reflex also strengthens. Rooting is the uh, searching for the nipple to suck on. Uh, C, babies who cry incessantly or become easily agitated typically show a weak rooting reflex at birth. Or D, sucking on a pacifier decreases crying and agitated movement in hungry neonates or newborns. Well, the answer is D, that a pacifier works. And the point of this one is that a pacifier doesn't give the kid any food. It does not solve the hunger problem. And that's what you would expect, that you know this behavior creates, uh, is rewarded in, in an operant conditioning term by satisfying this need, but it, it doesn't. And so that works against the idea that the sucking um, is, is learned uh, because it, it, it appears to be instinctual because it, it happens without the reward of food for a hungry child. All right, number four. According to a study conducted by the Children's Hospital in Boston, SIDS, or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, may be caused by what? A, high responsiveness of the cerebral cortex to glutamate. B, high responsiveness of the basal ganglia to dopamine. C, low responsiveness of the amygdala to acetylcholine. Or D, low responsiveness of the medulla to serotonin. So what we have here are four different brain structures and four different um, chemicals in the brain. And 
In this case, it turns out that the answer is the research suggests that sudden infant death syndrome may be caused by low responsiveness of the medulla to serotonin. Um, I think it's rather complicated. There's a lot of things that go into it, but it's nice to have that one lead. So serotonin in the medulla. Number five, by what factors do the head, torso, arms, and legs lengthen between birth and maturity? And I have to work not to say head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Head, torso, arms, and legs. It goes by two times, three times, four times, five times, three, two, five, and four times, four, three, two, five times, or two, four, three, five times. You know, pick your random numbers. Well, if you remember something about babies, you remember that there are two uh, patterns that characterize their growth. There's something called cephalocaudal. Cephalo for cephalus is the head, and then caudal is the tail, that they grow first at the head and slower at the tail or farther away from the head. The second one is proximodistal. Things that are closer into the spinal cord to the axis grow faster than things that are far away from it. Um, and so as a result, the answer to this one is A, the head is already real big when the baby's born, relatively speaking, proportionally speaking, and the torso, because it is axial, it's close to the axis, it's also relatively big. The arms, you know, they got a lot of growing to do, but nothing like the legs because they are both far away from, I mean, they're far away on the cephalocaudal. They're also a little off center in terms of proximal distal. And so the legs have the most growing to do. The head has the least um, between birth and maturity. All right, number six. At birth, full-term baby Shiloh is 18 inches in length. If Shiloh follows a typical growth pattern, on her first birthday, she will be how many inches tall? So she starts at 18, and one year later, what would we expect? 24 inches, 27 inches, 30 inches, or 33 inches? Well, it turns out that you expect a baby to grow about 50% in length during the first year. 50% of 18 inches is 9, so 18 and 9 together gets you 27 inches, and so uh, by normal standards, that's what you would expect after one year. Number seven, a root-like pattern of a neuron that receives impulses from other neurons is referred to as what? A, an axon, B, a dendrite, C, cilia, or D, flagella. Well, cilia and flagella are more, I mean, cilia are, are hairs and uh, flagella and how things move around, cells move around. Um, axon and dendrite are two parts of a nerve, and the one that we're looking for in this particular case is dendrite. That means um, branches, and so the cell body branches out and receives things from others. The axon is the long, thin part that transmits the, uh, uh, the neural impulse from the cell body uh, to its end. Um, anyhow, so it's dendrites are branches. Number eight, which brain region helps a child maintain balance, control motor behavior, and coordinate eye movements with bodily sensations? The choices are A, the medulla, B, the cerebellum, C, the cerebrum, or D, the amygdala. Well, for balance, motor behavior, eye movements, and so this is body stuff, the answer is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a small part of the brain in the very back. It looks like sort of a separate unit. In fact, it means sort of little brain. Um, and it has a lot to do with the kinesthetics and with um, uh, physical movement. Number nine, 10 month old Vanessa is overheard by her mother saying, ah, do, 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 then oh, ga, 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 as if she were having a conversation with herself. This is an example of what? A, intonation. B, echolalia, C, cooing, or D, babbling. Okay, babbling is going to be a lot of different phonemes, and cooing is sort of one sound, you know, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, intonation has more to do with, you know, how you pronounce, uh, how you pronounce things. Uh, it's echolalia, uh, which means uh, a, a repetition, uh, a, a, a verbal repetition. And that's what's going on right here with Vanessa, the I do 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 do, then ga 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 is the repetition is echolalia. Okay, last question in this quiz. 
What have the natives from an isolated Guatemalan village taught us about the capacity of children to recover from social deprivation? Because we have here is really an unfortunate natural experiment in which uh, children went through really serious deprivations. And the choices here are, although the Guatemalan, excuse me, although the Guatemalan children were socially and physically isolated as infants, retarding their progress, they had higher than average IQs by 11 years of age. Or B, Guatemalan children who were socially isolated as infants only recovered their physical and social abilities by age 11 if subsequently raised in industrialized society. So get out of the village and into the city or something. C, Guatemalan children who were isolated during their first year of life were physically and socially retarded yet, I mean, meaning just, you know, retarded means, you know, held back as opposed to advanced, which means moving forward. Uh, yet they were able to catch up with other children by 11 years of age, or D, only those Guatemalan children who were isolated as young infants and exposed to sufficient levels of natural sunlight were able to catch up with other children by 11 years of age. Okay, pick your poison. Uh, the answer here is C, that the Guatemalan children who were isolated during their first year of life were physically and socially retarded, so they were set back, they had problems, but they were able to catch up with other children by 11 years of age. It didn't require sunlight, didn't require moving to the big city. It just happens once you get in. You can get caught up, although it would be better not to be socially isolated in the first place. Anyhow, that finishes the first quiz for Chapter 3 on infancy and lifespan development. Thanks.